And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Sipsham people. A singing telegram is a message that's delivered by an artist in a musical form. Singing telegrams are historically linked to normal telegrams, but tend to be humorous. Although she no longer delivers singing telegrams, our guest still delivers the message. On today's Open Connection, Shadow Minister on Housing, Child Care, Autism and Accessibility, Gender Equality and Inclusion, Karen Kirkpatrick. Oh, I was born in Toronto, but I wouldn't say that that was home for me. So we moved pretty quickly to the prairies. I grew up in Edmonton. Um, and then uh, the second I graduated from high school, I moved to Vancouver. <laughs> so I was actually a musician at the time, and there was a lot more uh, music happening on the West Coast than there was uh, in Alberta. So that was one of the drivers. But I also just thought, I mean, British Columbia is amazingly beautiful. Why wouldn't I want to come and live here? Lead singer, guitar player, very mediocre guitar player. Good singer. <laughs> I was a rock and roll girl and I uh, supported myself that way and then when I de decided that really poverty was really not uh, as attractive as I thought it would be, uh, I start, I went back to school part-time and I just kept going to school and I had some really good opportunities with some different uh, bosses and so I uh, did an MBA and then I got an accounting designation and then because I can't focus on things, I then I did a law degree. So uh, And now I'm a politician. <laughs> when I did the law degree, um, uh, and it was more kind of a philosophical law degree, I did that full time. But up to that point, all of my school I did while I was working part time, and usually I was working full time and going to school part time. So, uh, but once you finish one thing, you just start to be interested in, in learning more about different things. And so I just continued on without any particular strategy in terms of where I was going to go. I just thought, gee, this looks interesting. Let me try this. And I had my own business for a while, and that's why I thought I better take the accounting so I knew how to balance my books, and uh, it was very valuable. I was uh, um, running a nonprofit organization, a family services organization in Vancouver that had a number of programs that were funded by, uh, by the provincial government. I had some frustrations in terms of how some of that funding was provided and how those programs were run. Uh, I also, with a, a fairly diverse background, I worked in a university, I uh, was the CEO of a, a real estate foundation here in BC and traveled the province quite a bit looking at sustainable housing developments. I just thought, you know, I'm at a point now where I can maybe put all of these things together uh, and I might have some good input into potential public policy and, uh, and I would enjoy that. My daughter just turned uh, 18 and she could live without me, so I figured uh, it was time to just try and do something where I kind of pull it all together. I, this isn't completely uh, government party specific, but it was certainly um, uh, exacerbated uh, when the current government came in is not resourcing nonprofit organizations to the level they should be resourced and yet expecting them to be able to deliver programs in the community that are valuable and are helping people. No ability to listen to new ideas, no ability to um, trust the experts in terms of the social workers and the youth support workers and the detox workers and listen to what their actual issues and concerns and needs are and be able to actually fund appropriately and, uh, and, and work collaboratively with the sector. So those were just all frustrations and I thought, gee, I would do this differently if I was government. And then someone said, well then why don't you <laughs> You're being a critic about government. Why don't you like really be a critic about government? So, so that's how I how I ended up here in part. I was elected in 2020. Uh, there was virtually no campaigning. There were a number of Zoom calls. Once I was elected, I actually didn't physically meet my colleagues. Some of them for months. Uh, because the actual legislature was operating virtually. So a lot of uh, the folks, Ellis Ross, people that were coming uh, from the north or traveling long distances, they were just dialing, I shouldn't say they were just, but they were dialing in virtually to the legislature. So because I'm close to Victoria, I was sent over there and I think there were about eight of us allowed to be in the house at one time. 
So my first day, somebody gave me an access pass and showed me the door and I wandered around in this building by myself, uh, ran into a few people. Um, it was really bizarre, but I still to this day when I walk in there, I look around and I think, I can't believe somebody gave me a key to this place. Like, I, why, I just, it's amazing that I get to be in that building. It's, I'm so honored. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thanks for staying with us. Kirkpatrick has served as CEO and Registrar of Private Career Training Institutions Agency of BC, as CEO of Real Estate Foundation of BC, and Assistant Dean of UBC's Salder School of Business. Let us return to the conversation as Karen shares where her passion lies. Shadow Minister for, it's just a fun way of saying critic. Um, so uh, Shadow Minister of Housing and Child Care. And so um, initially I was a Shadow Minister for uh, Ministry of Children and Families. And that's because my social services organization, that, that, that was the contract that I was getting annoyed with. But my background um, and passion is really in, um, in real estate. And in real estate in so much as I should say housing as opposed to real estate and creating affordable housing, ladders to housing ownership, uh, creating community with housing. And so I was really honored when Kevin Falcon asked if I would take on the housing file. So uh, it's always been something I've been interested in and that I've worked in uh, off and on for many years. And I'm really excited about it. And I was happy to come up uh, to Terrace and Kitimat and, uh, and take a look around and learn a little bit more about some of the, the housing issues that you've got here. So, I mean, every community is unique and every community kind of started uh, this housing crisis with a, a, you know, a different inventory, a different kind of housing, um, different demands on our people coming in or moving out. And, uh, but in terms of the rents and the lack of uh, potential accommodation for people, whether it's purchasing or, or renting, those are really similar. And um, the increase in the cost of housing relative to increases in people's income uh, it's uh, it's substantive and it, every community in British Columbia is really seeing that. And then how are we resolving it? Every municipal council is struggling with how do we zone things? How do we get things built more quickly? You know, how do we match our housing supply to our population? So those things are the same. Um, when you add LNG and other, you know, big industries into communities, that has its own strain uh, and challenges on housing as well. I think if we can be creative as government, if we can look at different ways of envision, envisioning housing, we really look at housing in a very traditional North American kind of way where we have home ownership or we have rental. Um, and there's so many ways where we can have, you know, lease to own, where we can build more co-ops, where we can look at um, cooperative partnerships between parties who, you know, want to buy and build something together. There's a number of different ways we can look at housing, and I'm excited that there are potentials for that. So I, uh, I believe that she will have those opportunities, but we just need to get on with it in this province, and we need to be creative and look at different ways uh, to house people. Another piece of what I do is um, uh, government through Ministry of Children and Families has a program uh, through the Children and Youth with uh, Support Needs where they provide funding to um, families of children who have autism. And so the NDP government about a year and a bit ago actually pulled back that funding, they clawed back that funding, and it's caused a lot of challenges, uh, particularly concerns in smaller communities where it's harder to access some of the resources that uh, kiddos with autism need in order to um, be able to uh, work with therapists and, and physio and do all the things that they really need to do so that they can develop. Uh, so I, I've come up to have an opportunity to talk to some of the families here, learn a little bit more about some of the autism resources and supports here, uh, what the CDC does here, um, and uh, what kinds of things we can, uh, in a government-in-waiting, uh, develop 
so that we can we can put better supports in place in future and that in the interim we can actually advocate with government to try and get better supports so that's that's one of the reasons I was here was uh, was coming to talk to a lot of people about autism which is a big issue right now I'll tell you what was really interesting actually and I'm even still a bit emotional because we just did that before I came over to talk to you um, it, it was completely surprising to me how that conversation went I thought that it was going to be parents who had real concerns about the changes that have been uh, made with government recently. What I heard were a lot of people who just needed somebody to listen so that they could share their personal stories. But all of those personal stories, and they were sharing them with each other, and there were tears, and it was really, really emotional. But the message is that um, families just do not have the resources in this region to be able to access supports for their children. Um, even, you know, wait list getting into the CDC, can they find a speech language, language pathologist, can they, the resources aren't here, nobody's helping them to try and find those resources, uh, and it's so stressful and, and terrifying for some parents. Many parents have to leave their job so that they can stay home with their child to be with that child because there is no child care for that child. And, uh, there are no support services and therapies or respite for that child. So many of the same issues that we find in um, more urban areas in BC, but exacerbated just because, you know, just as your healthcare system is, is, uh, is in crisis, it, it, here it's even more pronounced because you're losing your doctors and you're losing your nurses. Well, you've also lost those counselors and supportive services for uh, children who are neurodiverse kiddos who have autism. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Last year, the Ministry of Children and Family Development introduced a new centralized service system based on regional hubs to provide support for children based on their unique needs, regardless of having a diagnosis or not. Let us return the conversation as Karen shares some of the feedback she has heard during a recent town hall session in Terrace. One of the big issues that was really clear to me today is the lack of information and there's no kind of point place to go to get information. Um, and clearly we need to speed up the time that it takes for a young person to get a diagnosis or to get an assessment. If you do not have a diagnosis or assessment, you cannot access programs and you cannot access programs uh, and funding from government. And there is, you know, a two, th three year wait list to actually get a diagnosis. And then you've lost all of that time for that young person to be supportive, all of that time for you to have funding where you could be providing um, programs and services to them. And so being able to move quickly, focus on providing more professionals in the sector and easier access to diagnosis and assessment. There's so much more outside of that, but that's the first piece of it because it takes, the longer it takes for a young person to get into therapies and supports, the, the, you've lost a lot of opportunity there to help that young person uh, in their life moving forward. I have seen and heard amazing stories. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I knew very little about autism until October of 2021 uh, when government rolled back the funding. And then I was immediately contacted by, there were thousands of parents in British Columbia and a whole number of advocacy organizations. I got to meet families. I got to meet these children. I got to understand what parents were going through. And I mean, understand from the outside, but still seeing what it is like. Uh, for a parent who has had a child who has had access to to therapists and um, and one that hasn't and the and the differences in that child and that child's independence and that's that child's 
um, ability to interact and to go to school and I mean it's it's night and day so I have seen the difference that these therapies and access to services make and it's got to be access to the right therapies and services as well um, you know uh, some some kiddos just need to uh, have an opportunity to play sports so that they can physically you know um, have an opportunity to, to get exercise but they can also start to do some kind of team building and you know and then other kids Kiddos need far more intensive therapies and will always be living at home with their parents or somebody who's going to have to look after them, but there's still so many things that we can do at an early age to actually help that uh, and help these young people be the best that they can be. Oh, there's lots of issues and there's lots of issues with how government is trying to roll out the $10 a day childcare. First off, I 100% believe in universal childcare. Good quality childcare should be accessible to all. And then you start looking at doctors and nurses and first responders who I've talked to in this community who don't have childcare. So you can see the bigger impact that it has when you've got a nurse who has to leave a community because they don't have childcare. So there's, there's lots of issues around that. But what has happened is um, government has not rolled it out equitably. Federal government has come in and said there's going to be $10 a day childcare, but it's up to the provincial governments to figure out how to roll that out. So at this point, I believe out of 136,000 licensed child care spaces we have in BC, about 12,500 of them are now $10 a day. So what that means is that you've got two people living beside each other. One has, you know, they both have a four-year-old. Over the course of 12 months, one's paid 17,000 and one's paid 4,400 for that same child care. So there's been some real inequities in rolling this out. And they've also really hurt the child care providers because they have, um, push the fees down so low and the subsidy that government gives to them so low that they're having a hard time covering expenses, let alone operating. Um, and that pushes down wages too because it's the number one expense that a child care provider has is to pay wages. So government wants us to increase ECE wages, but then they're not funding child care providers to, enough so that they can actually do that. Well, doing it faster, um, and I'm not really sure why things have taken so long to actually roll things out. They've been referring to these $10 a day sites as pilot sites, but I think when you've had something going for five years, you're either in or out, right? Like it's a pilot or it's not. So make a, make a commitment to it. And I really think the funding should have been rolled out in an equitable way so all parents would be benefiting at the same time. So for example, in um, another province, rather than have this small group of parents get $10 a day and everybody else paying, uh, you know, their $1,800 a month, um, all parents would get a discount of 15% and then 25% and then up to the point where everybody's got the $10 a day but then all British Columbians, all parents would have been able to benefit from that in an equal and equitable way which hasn't been the case here. Um, and work realistically with childcare providers, talk to them, understand what their needs are and fund them properly. I can tell you that childcare providers are not there to make big bucks. Most are um, women who are independent, you know, small business people who probably had a, their own childcare need at some point, which then it was the impetus for starting their businesses. On average, childcare providers make, you know, 2% margin. So they're, they're in there because they love the work and you got to work with them and not um, punish them uh, for wanting to provide childcare. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. British Columbia will require an additional 12,000 early childhood educators to achieve the government's commitment to universal child care. Higher wages are required to retain qualified staff, recruit qualified staff into new programs, and encourage people to enter this field. In this final segment of Open Connection, Karen shares some of the challenges facing ECE workers. One of the bigger issues um, is back to wages with ECE workers. So early childhood educators get underpaid. 
they are looking after our most valuable asset and they should be um, paid appropriately and compensated and appreciated appropriately. Uh, so it, because we do not have a proper wage grid and we're not paying childcare providers enough, we don't have enough ECE workers. So you can, you know, as I say, it doesn't matter how cheap your childcare is if you don't have childcare. And I know in Kitimat, in Terrace, there's a lot of issues where you've got staffing issues across the board. Finding people who will work in child care centers is, is probably more challenging than actually finding the spaces to operate the child care centers. So it's investment in and encouragement of people who are going to become child care professionals, get their ECE designations and work in these communities. Um, that is something that is in crisis and we need to, uh, to, to make sure that we're investing in people, we're paying them well. That's how we open more child care centers. I think anything like that. Um, so I don't know, maybe they get discounted housing. Maybe, I mean, there's, let's pull out all these ideas and think of, you know, what, what they could, maybe it is a preferential tax rate. I mean, we can look at this for any kind of profession where we really need to get more people. Government is trying to figure out how to pay doctors so that we can encourage people to be doctors and, you know, and continue to, to work in communities. So taking a look at those critical positions and childcare educators are critical, uh, you know, a, a critical role in society. Sure, that's uh, that's a great idea. So this is just, the house just rose last week, and so I was back in my own community for a week, and so now I am committed to uh, traveling to other parts of British Columbia and uh, having a chance to really understand what communities are like. Uh, and it's not just on my, you know, not just on housing and childcare and autism funding. Um, it's just lifestyle in different communities. I want to understand LNG. I want, you know, I, I was able to go and wander around and sight see. And so these are really important, I think, particularly for MLAs like myself who represent a very urban riding. Uh, so my next stop, I, uh, I was in Kamloops two weeks ago. I know I'm going to Kelowna soon, uh, Prince George, so we'll, we'll see. My niece is a doctor, so they moved to the community a few years ago. So, I'm, uh, I, so I had two reasons to come up and, uh, and say hello. You know what, to be honest, I was so in awe when we were landing in the plane today. I thought this is just so beautiful, the mountains and the, it reminds me a little bit and I hope that, I, I don't know if people love Banff or not, but I was saying to someone on the way here, when I was a kid I spent a lot of time in Banff and there's something about like a really lovely small community but in the backdrop you've got these mountains and there's snow and then there's just so many amazing things to do and the, you know, river and um, so yeah, I really like it. Uh, I certainly like this area and I'm happy uh, to have a chance to travel to some other areas. But when I was with the Real Estate Foundation, um, I did uh, travel quite a bit in the north to various communities just to see what their housing issues were. And uh, yeah, I love it. Yeah, I would love to hear from people um, on any of those issues. It helps me to know what the, the key things are we should be looking at. Um, well, I'm very Googleable. is that a word? Uh, <laughs> just look me up online. So Corinne Kirkpatrick, uh, you know, official opposition, BC United, uh, you'll be able to find me. Um, contact Alice Ross uh, in the MLA office here and he's certainly able to make a connection as well. So I just really appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation with you today and everybody here has just been so friendly and so nice today. So I'm looking for, and I like the sun, so thank you for that. It's, uh, it's been a beautiful day. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection of his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictow.